Right, welcome back to the Grappling with Physio podcast. I'm joined today with Adam Lisson. Uh, Adam is one of the presenters, well, is the main presenter of the Grumpy Surfy pod, sorry, the Grumpy Surfer podcast. Uh, head coach at, how do you pronounce it? Mahara Mahara. Jitsu, Mahara, Mahara Jiu Jitsu and uh, Adamant Surfer, BJJ practitioner, podcaster, also works uh, in kind of sports massage therapy and also is a practitioner of the bowing technique. Adam, thanks for coming on, mate. Outstanding, mate. Yeah, I've been uh, been looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, we've been forwards and backwards trying to get this sorted and you know what it's like running your own podcast. It's a kind of sometimes you can plan for the best and then you sometimes you have to react and just go, I'm free now. Are you free? Should we? Yeah, yeah let's do it. So first of all, how does it feel being on the other side of the microphone? <laughs> Uh, do you know what, right? It's, and this is this is the first one. This is the first one that I've done. So I've been doing podcasting now for like two and a half years or something like that. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's 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 good, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, do you know what? I decided to um, about about eight months ago. I decided to to write um, start writing a book um, about sort of like all my experiences tying it in with surfing and jujitsu and and all that kind of thing because. Um, you know, I think everybody's got a, a, like their own kind of unique story, and I, I guess you, you could say that's kind of a bit big-headed. But um, you know, I, I think everybody in their own in the right mind's got a, got an interesting story at one point or another. Hence the reason why we get into podcasting, right? Absolutely, yeah. No, I, I'd agree. I think everybody has got a story to tell. Um, one of those. I suppose chapters of the of your story is the fact that you are a former Royal Marine and you left last year. So let's kind of like let, let's concentrate on that aspect of things because there's a lot in common here. You know, this is the grappling with physio, omics forces. We've both got BJJ in common. We've both got the forces element, um, and we've also got rehabilitation. We've been a physio, and you've been a sports massage therapist. There's lots of kind of grounds and familiar ground to talk about. So. Where, how old were you when you joined the Marines and, and why did you pick the Marines over other aspects of the forces? So when I was growing up, my, my dad was in the, um, was in the TA. He was in the, in, in the Fusiliers and um, he ran Cope Hill down for, for quite a while, um, you know, doing like all the obvious sort of things. So, uh, and before him, my, my, my dad's dad uh, was in the second world war. He was in the uh, Polish, uh, Polish special forces. Um, so there's a there's a bit of a bit of a family background there, and I always kind of wanted to be in the armed forces, I guess, because I grew up with like the things like Rambo and Commando and stuff, and thought that yeah, that's well cool. I want to I want to go around blowing stuff up and shooting people like you do <clears> as a <throat> uh, as a kid. Um, and uh, when I, when I was at school, there was a friend of mine whose uncles were in the uh, special boat service, and uh, you know, at Christmases and and, and other points of um, like holidays, they used to come back and you know spin a few stories of grandeur and you know what what they could tell at, at the time. And uh, there was about ten or eleven of us um, at school, and we like, Do you know what, we're going to join the Royal Marines. And uh, I was the only one that did. So um, yeah, I did. I did my first year of um, of A levels, and I and I ended up hating the education system. I was just kind of, I just kind of did it because. Um, it was just a elongating, you know, getting a job, I guess. And then uh, when I was 17, I did my potential Royal Marines course. Um, I passed it first time. And yeah, I was straight into recruit training in uh, the year 2000. So May 2000 and yeah, turned 18 on the first exercise. So yeah, that's kind of how my story started in the military. Wow. Prior to kind of like joining and doing your pre-selection recruitment course did you do any sports or were you quite a fit and healthy guy anyway yeah I, I played I played rugby since the the early days of um of of joining high school I wasn't one of these guys that you know went through sort of a program because there wasn't anything really in the 90s especially for rugby because it was amateur at the time um but yeah I, I was good I was fast um and I ended up getting a, offered a scholarship as well for playing for Worcester Warriors um nice. when um when when it was kind of transitioning in the in the late nineties, early aughties to uh to professional rugby. So um but I enjoyed playing rugby and I played rugby because it was fun, like jujitsu, right? You 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 do it because because it's fun. You wouldn't do anything unless you enjoyed doing it. Um 
And I got to a kind of a crossroads in my life when I was when I was 17. And when it started turning a little bit more professional and the coaches started to be more serious and they and you know, when you when you didn't turn up to training or they turned up to training that you didn't learn a move or um you you couldn't comprehend something, they were like, if you don't get this, you're not playing the game. Well, one of my one of my big things like internally was I used to shine when I was on the pitch playing a game. And uh, it just got to the point where it, it kind of it kind of took my my enjoyment away from it and i was like Do you know what sod this i'm not doing this and and i and i joined the marines so instead of going down that path i went the other way and joined the military what what year did you join uh 2000 okay all right oh nice yeah how did you find it training i hated it <laughs> I to the I'm not going to lie about that <laughs> yeah. at all. I don't know uh, anybody that says they like it, but uh, well, I, I everybody's think, I personal think, perspective is always interesting. There, I think training has has definitely changed in the in the last ten years. Definitely, Jeff, definitely for the good, with with all this teach coach mental side of things. I've got a few guys because I live a mile and a half down the road from um, the commander training center, so I get a few guys that are in recruit training at the moment that come and train with me. Um, on a Sunday and they, they talk about how much they enjoy it and what they're doing and all this sort of thing. And I was like, something must be wrong here. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I mean, I took, I took six troops through recruit training during my um, time in the career, you know, three years a, a, as a recruit instructor and then uh, three as a PTI. And I was like, that. how, how do you enjoy it? Because I, all I remember is just being scared every single day. Uh, didn't want to mess up because I got screamed at every single day i was told i was shit and i was going to get back trooped and i was never going to pass out of training yeah um but i guess that's you know some people kind of crumble under that sort of pressure but other people would kind of go do you know what this is not going to determine this is going to make me more determined and that's what it did i was just like i ain't giving up i'm just going to keep going and if i get kicked out i get kicked out you know but yeah it was kind of one of them and uh yeah i, I got to a point where I, I I got towards the end of training, like the final exercises, uh, like the final um, field firing packages, the shooting packages and the final X. And I was just, oh man, I just can't wait for this to end. Uh, and th- this is going to sound quite, quite sad, really, because this should be sort of like the, the pinnacle of everybody that passes out of training, you know, their pass out day. Everybody's really happy. Their families come down and say, oh, well done. You've done, you know, one of the hardest um, one of the hardest 32 weeks of training in the world. Nobody else has done it. And I was like, fucking hell, I just want to get to my unit and just get on with it. You know, I was, I was just kind of, it, it, it was kind of beyond me. And, and I felt a little bit sorry for my family because my sister came down and my mom and dad, and I'm quite a non-emotional person at the best of times. And I was just kind of like, I was just tired and worn out. And I was like, man, just, yeah, I was, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, right? If I look back at it now, yeah. I was still kind of mentally broken, even when I passed out of training. It was crazy. Yeah, it, it's funny, isn't it? Because you can go like through your kind of military service, not remember certain aspects, but sta- training always stays with you. You know what I mean? Most of the training has a massive impact because i suppose it's so life-changing that's a transition point you know civilian to soldier marine sailor airman whatever (laughs) but it definitely does have its uh its impact so how long did you serve in the end i did the full 22 oh wow Um, Wow. yeah so i i got to um yeah so i joined up 14th of may 2000 and i officially left uh the 15th of may uh 2023 uh 2022 it's last year wasn't it yeah <laughs> 2022 fantastic um, was that part of the pt core no so i i for the first half of my career i was um i was in a specialist uh role within the marines called um anti-tanks or heavy weapons so my, my primary role was like you know shooting big guns sh- throwing anti-tank missile launchers out and just blowing shit up and shooting massive guns you know that was that was kind of my job and you know it it was pretty cool i ended up doing um three tours of afghan and the invasion of iraq uh through kind of the anti-tanks branch and um nice yeah half halfway through my career um after herrick 12 i'd i decided and i'd sat down with my wife um, who i'd been through herrick 5 with and herrick 12 
And we were like, do you know what? I'm, I've lost all my cat lives here. If I keep mm-hmm. going away, I, I, because, you know, being in, being in that role, being in the anti-tanks role, was very much in the thick of things all the time. Um, you know, right, like, you know, right on the front line of everything. And I'd been in a lot of contacts. I'd, I'd got blown up. You, you, you're you going to like this story. If I counted up, I, I got, um, I got Kazivact on Herrick 5 because I got blown up in a, in a Wimmick. Um, and then on Herrick 12, I got blown up 21 times um in vehicles and uh i was just kind of like ah, do you know what i need to change the direction here otherwise i'm 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 not getting out of this life um you know wow. with with all my limbs in part so i decided to change branches and um and join, join the pt branch within the royal marines uh, a lot of my friends were part of that as well and uh and just decided to take a, a, another direction within the marines um saying that i took a massive hit with promotion as well you know, so I, I got I, I got picked up for promotion as a sergeant on the tail end of um, on the tail end of that in 2011, and it took me another seven years to um, to get to get promoted back to kind of like where I was. So I was a little bit <laughs> I was a little bit behind behind the curve with that. But you know, I, I wouldn't have had the lifestyle I, I did for the second half of my career than I would uh, and do the things I do now. Like you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, how, so this is platoon sergeant. Uh, is this platoon sergeant in the anti tanks or Milan platoon? Or um, yeah, so uh, um, the way that it works, it's a little bit different from 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 the army because you have, um, I think, your I think a sergeant in the army looks after a like a detachment of um, a detachment of of people in heavy weapons whereas in the marines a sergeant looks after a troop which is three separate detachments um so you've got anywhere up to kind of 15 guys i mean the troop normally like when we were on the herrick tours we had like you know 20 odd blokes in it in in our troop so Mm. you kind of looked after that and um the tail end of my career i I, even though i was a corporal at the time still i uh, i stepped up to the role of of a uh, of filling in those boots as troop sergeant, so I'd kind of had that experience before I even got promoted into it. If that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Okay, so uh, when you kind of when you st- stepped over, was that was that a tough transition, or you know, going from kind of a, I would say probably spending most of your time cammed up, living out of a kind of a gonk bag to flexing in front of the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get what you mean. I, I, I guess uh, if if anybody knows me and anyone listens to this that knows me, like previously, you would not have thought that I would end up in the PT branch in the Marines. You know, I was never, yeah. I was never the fittest guy. <clears throat> I was never the biggest. You know, I'm five foot six, stroke seven. Um, you know, 70, 76 kilos. Um, I'm quite stocky, but. You know, when when we were doing um when we were going through PT selection, like I was thirty, I was thirty years old. Uh, a lot of the other guys were sort of like early to mid twenties. Um, there was a friend of mine actually, uh, a, a lad called Gilly, and uh, he was three years older. So me and him, were, we went through training together at, at a certain point. So we were kind of like the old men at the back, like proper hanging out on on everything, like everything. <laughs> Recovery took longer. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't move most days until I got warmed up. You know, I'm even worse now because you know I'm trained jujitsu like you know pretty much ten hours a week. It's it's yeah. I think it was just kind of like it just started like that and it hasn't finished yet. You know. Well, jits has a great way of breaking down the body. Um, did uh, you know? Did it ever? Like, I, I always remember because like I left literally just shy of six years um and i remember going in and 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 i mean i literally joined i would probably say for kind of social economical reasons you know the army i actually went for the marines i always say this to my mate one of my best mates he's actually a bootneck i say i went for the marines and he went i know yeah you weren't good enough and i guess you bastard but no i did i went in and uh i've wore glasses for years and he, he you know he I was I was living in Birmingham at the time, and they didn't actually have a recruitment office in Birmingham. You had to go to Coventry, 
which is funny enough where oh, I live really? now. So uh, you went in and the guy was just like, well, let's have a look at these glasses. And at that time he went, oh, flipping hell. <laughs> you know? He went, right, let's do the eye test. And I was so bad. <laughs> he says, try it without the glasses. Try it with the glasses. He says, look, I'm not being funny, but they're quite selective. And I was like, all right, okay. He says, so, you know, the Marines aren't going to take it. It's not going to, we'll, we'll probably leave it, you know, if things improve. And I said, well, they're not going to. And uh, I always tell this story, but like in his shadow was this recruiting sergeant with a cup of tea. And as soon as he said, good luck, son, he was like, wait, come here. <laughs> we'll, we'll have you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the irony was in basic training, I got best shot. <laughs> do you you always do. There's a there's a guy I know uh, called uh, called Susat, believe it or not, and yeah, uh, yeah he's uh, he's very he's very similar. He wears glasses, um, yeah. and uh, well, I think that's why he got his nickname from, just because because he, he wears glasses. Because he wears, yeah, yeah. Well, it's either Susat or binos, isn't it? It's like you know, or Penfold or any kind of visually impaired like you know name that they ac- attribute to you. You're going to pick it up. So yeah, did um. Did I mean it's? I suppose it's still quite raw because you've only been there a year. How how was that transition leaving? You know, because I planned for it. I I I oh. planned for it. A kind of quite in advanced. I keep having these conversations with people because my peer group, are, you know, are slowly leaving now, and uh, or, or or extending. Mm. And uh, I always have this conversation with people about. Um, you know, what do you enjoy doing? What are your passions? And uh, what do you want to do? And generally, nine times out of 10, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I want to do. Now, you know yourself, or you might not know yourself through sort of um, when people when people leave the military, there's a, uh, there's a company called the Career Transition Partnership that kind of help with that transition piece where people can go on courses, whether it's... Um, I don't know, like builders, like tradesmen, builders, plumbers, all that sort of thing, plasterers, electricians. You can go down the uh, health and safety road or the um, project managing kind of road, which a lot of people do. And they kind of, I think in a way they inadvertently get funneled down into that. And uh, in my opinion, they're not, they're not like, they're not great jobs. And some people might be might be happy with doing that i didn't i didn't want to do that um i i'd spent my time in the marines uh the last 12 years when i was a pti uh working in the working in gyms on my own so you know building management uh writing programs uh, equipment procurement um all all that sort of stuff and because I was good with my time management, I was I could get all that done super quickly, and then I could go surfing, uh, you know, uh, if I was in North Devon or train jiu-jitsu at lunchtime. I used to run clubs since I was a blue belt um, at lunchtimes at my unit, uh, at, at any unit I was on. So we just used to teach then, and we used to roll and stuff. So I used to do things that I that I enjoyed doing. So when it came to sort of like the the three years out that I um when I was leaving, I went to the education office and I said, look, you know, I'm leaving. I want to be proactive about it. Uh, You know, can I, is there anything I can do now to start the process? And they said to me, nah, nah, you um, come back in, in, you know, when you've got two years left, you'll, you'll get the emails and, uh, and, you know, you can, you can start that process then. So I was like, "Mm, right, right. Okay. And it came to it came to sort of like the the six months before the two year point came up, and uh, my mum, she's been into holistic therapies or been involved in holistic therapies as a business, uh, you know, for uh, 15, 15, 20 years. A bone therapist, reflexologist, um, you know, did does things with dietary stuff, uh, mental health, well being, and all that sort of thing. So you know, she's quite integrated into it. And she said to me, um, look. I'll pay for the first few modules of your of your bowen course, uh, your bone technique course, and if you and if you like it, you know you can continue doing it. Yeah. And I was like, right, okay. And I had bowen before with her, and any black or white male who's been in a male dominant environment, and you'll know yourself that whenever people 
um, want to have therapy. They want to feel like something is being fixed. Something is happening with them. And I was kind of like it. And bone is very light. It's very sort of um, superficial, just kind of it's like little rolls over your skin. Um, and I never really noticed any change. Little did I know that actually stuff was happening but I just hadn't recognized it. So I'd, I'd go back to my mom's house, for instance. I'm digressing massively here. <laughs> Carry on, mate. Let's go for it. And uh, I'd go home and I'd say, oh, do you know what? My shoulder really hurts, you know, because I've been carrying a Bergen for, you know, going on pre-selections and stuff like that. And uh, I'd go home and she'd right, lie down on the couch and she'd do a few little moves. And I'd be lying there going, this is, uh, this is bollocks. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is not doing anything. <laughs> But then about four or five days later, I wouldn't have noticed that the pain's gone away. And I'd just be cracking on doing my own thing. And, and little did I know, you know, all these years later, that she's kind of like just sitting there, pursing her lips, nodding her head, going, yep, that worked. Anyway, um, so I, I went and did this, uh, this Bowen course, um, you know, nearly two years out. Uh, it wasn't part of the it wasn't part of the funding that you could get to go and do uh, therapy courses, uh, <clears throat> and um, yeah, it, it really kind of appealed to me, and uh, it really resonated with 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 what I was doing. Is you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna do this, and then the more I did it, the more the more I thought, you know, the, the there's such a gap in the market for something like this at the moment, and there's nothing really ran by like where I am in in Devon. Um, people doing this and not many people know about the bone technique either so I thought you know the this the scope here to do something so uh, I was already at that point before I'd even started that that transition out thinking about like you know I could make this work um, and uh, COVID hit uh, it took me about 18 months to pass the course where it should have just taken about a year and then just as I got qualified, we came out of COVID and then I started my clinic in, I want to say 2021. Oh, so I was still in, I was still serving, uh, but I was doing one day a week, which is what I'm still doing now. And um, yeah, I've, I decided that I was going to start building up my client base nice and slowly. So because my plan in my head was I was going to be qualified 18 months before I left. And I would be able then to start building a client base before I left, but only had six months. So everything that I'm doing now and I've kind of fallen into is just kind of slowly started to become um, a, uh, you know, a career path that I can, you know, still do the things I enjoy doing, have free time, but also earn, earn some money by helping people, which is, you know, which is pretty cool, really. Yeah, um, I would say having failed running a private practice because I stretched myself too thin, um, you're only as good as your last patient. Yeah, and um, this kind of it's a bit of a quagmire where if you kind of want to deliver evidence based practice or you you your job is to diagnose, manage, and then treat, and sometimes that requires that requires education, talking to people, letting them know what their condition is, letting them know what the prognosis is, recovery timeframes, um, what they need to avoid, aggravation, fa aggravating factors, you know, eases, push them towards things that make them better, et cetera. And sometimes people, when they come to the clinic and they're paying you, when there's a trans, when there's a transaction and cash trans like goes from one person to another, sometimes unless you you've got to get it right and this is something i think everybody's learning in private practice that this might there might be an expectation on the patient or the client's side to say well i'm paying you for a certain service and that can kind of put you sometimes in turmoil wherever i've been in those situations wherever people come to me and i here's one example i used to practice acupuncture so i did musculoskeletal based acupuncture uh, very early on, about three years after I'd graduated, and I was just, oh, this is fantastic, great. This is another kind of string, another modality or string to the bow. 
I do acupuncture. They did, they did further modules on electroacupuncture, right? That's where you fire the needles in, you put electrodes in, and you send a current, and it creates a circumducting loop um, of electrical current going through and out through the muscle and back through the machine. And I was thinking, this is fantastic. This is just giving me more and more kind of scope, etc. Then they changed the nice guidelines, and then they took acupuncture away because the only thing that was kind of supported very minimalistically was lower back pain, all right? And I think it was kind of i don't even think it was chronic i think it was kind of subacute so kind of chronic low back pain is about as useful as a chocolate teapot so don't bother don't bother doing it so then they they take the evidence away and they say well we're not going to support this anymore and then you kind of you think right well how can i you know how can i truly practice this if i don't you know believe it i've got to believe that it works etc or or the evidence has got to be there so i can believe that it works etc or i can sh i can say well if we follow this you know these guidelines there's a good chance you'll get a good recovery and then i stopped practicing it and then it, it and then it was a case where people were still coming and expecting the acupuncture and then i was saying well we're not going to do that today and you know sorry <laughs> And you might lose a few patients and, you know, and then you've, but you've got to kind of handle it right. You've got to say, okay, yeah, no problem. We're not going to do that today. But, you know, if you want to see somebody else, because that's, these are the kind of ethical grounds I'm going to stick to. These are, this is how I run my practice or how I run my business and how I practice as a clinician. This is what I stick to. So if that's not going to fit with you, then you're probably better off finding somebody else. So, it's difficult. It, it is difficult, mate. Um, I always find though, like, especially when people turn up, I'm very blunt. I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to kind of, you know, put, put a diagnosis or I, I don't even diagnose. I won't even put something up on the chalkboard and smudge the emis, uh, edges to make it, you know, smoke and mirrors and make it look a little bit better. I will make it clear to, I make it clear to my clients when they come in and I say, look, this works for some people. Some people it doesn't work for. That's why yeah. it is a complementary therapy. There are other complementary yeah. therapies out there that actually work for you. Now, let's do a couple of sessions, see if it works for you. If it does, brilliant. We can continue. We, we can kind of look at the continuation of your recovery pathway. Or I know a few of the people that are um, osteopaths, that are physiotherapists, that, that can help you a little bit more um than than what i could and uh you know and i'll and i'll um i'll forward them on to them guys you know or I'll, I'll refer them on i'm never going to turn around to somebody and say to them look you know what i'm going to do here is you know is going to sort your back pain out i'm never going to say that to them because you're kind of digging yourself a massive hole in the first place yeah. because you're 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 building expectation for yeah. people absolutely you know, it's, that, it's the same as kind of like jujitsu as well right like someone comes mm. through the door and say like you know i want to learn to defend myself when like well at the end of the day i'm going to give you the toolkit to do that but then everything else comes down to you it's it's how you uh, how you perceive it and you how you take those things on board yeah yeah no totally it, there's, there's nothing worse than over promising and then under delivering um did you kind of transitioning over have have you had those moments where you've kind of just you know things are now i've not suffered with them myself initially uh, you know well again i don't think i did long enough to kind of we felt like i had one foot in the door in there with, with civilian street but you know having done such a long time have you had any moments where you've just been like oh god what have i done this is just you know or have you found a transition you know relatively easy or I've been very lucky. I uh, I believe that um, all, I kind of take it back a few stages. All the things that I've done, um, you know, within the military, the majority, the majority of my career has been operational. So, you know, I've seen some pretty gnarly stuff, uh, been in some gnarly situations, um, you know, like I previously mentioned. Um, so I, I've always been a big, um, I've always been quite self-aware of kind of my, my own mental health and my physical well-being. I think that's where jujitsu and, um, and surfing has really, has really helped me because, um, I've, I've said, I said this previous, said this before, and I always kind of say it, is that I believe that these are the anchors for me. If I didn't have them, I'd be in a, you know, I'd be in a, I'd be in a world of hurt. Um, so 
my my transition out was kind of i guess a little bit seamless because i had no expectation of what was going to happen i had this plan two to three years out what i was going to do and i was slowly implementing it to the point where i was leaving um and i'd also spent 10 years working in gyms where i was basically my own boss i was running my own i was running i was running my own gym you know I, I was the custodian of building management, looking after it, making sure the cleaners did their job. Um, I, you know, it's kind of the example I kind of used how how a unit PTI would work is that imagine an LED center. You're the only person that works there. Um, you know, you you look after the kit. You do this. You do that. So you you've got a big a big kind of burden to kind of look after as well as doing all the fitness testing adventure training getting people away organizing events sporting events for the unit so they can have fun you're kind of like the red coat as well so any sort of like get together you're standing out there and going bah you know jazz hands out and you know that you've you've got kind of like that um but lens red coat persona that has to come out and you've got to make people, you know, feel enthused and excited and, you know, want to do the things that you're putting in front of them. Um, so, you know, when, when I, when I came to leaving the, the thing that I didn't had previously, you know, when I was away is that uh, communal bond of being around men and people that um, you're always surrounded by people. So I, d I didn't really have that. So I I didn't really I didn't really have a transition out because everything that I wanted to do I'd already done the qualifications for before it came to like my last nine months where you can go away and do all of your courses. So what well, January twenty twenty two, um, the nineteenth of January was my last official day, kind of in the military before you know my tx date so i had like five months realistically so i kind of before i left so i kind of just walked into my clinic and it wasn't until sort of like the january time um i had a conversation with uh with a friend of mine who's now one of the uh, head coaches up here at sbg in manchester a guy called uh jordan desbra jarvis and uh he said um you're good at coaching jiu-jitsu what why don't why don't you start teaching jiu-jitsu and i was like I never really thought about it really um that was sort of like the tail end of january and then two weeks later i'd find, found somewhere uh i'd found some spare mats that people didn't use and uh i'd set mojave jiu-jitsu up and um yeah you know a year later i've now got you know a a good core uh set of students that turn up and train you know my classes are nearly full i run five classes a week and they're in and, and i'm always looking to to expand it and you know the, the answer to your question in the in kind of like a really long way is that you know yes i do have those times and probably about six to eight months after i left i did have the anxiety of um where's the money coming from? I had my pension. So I had my pension literally like a month after I left, you know, which was okay. Um, I, but I was literally like when I came up to sort of Christmas last year, um, it, everything was really fluctuating. You know, I'd have a full set of people on the mats. I then have two. I'd have a full day of clients. I then have none. So it's kind of like, <laughs> what am I doing you know, how do I need to work a way into advertising? I didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't pay people, um, you know, to do social media for me or do do um, do advertising and, and marketing for me. I had to kind of semi learn that stuff myself. Um, so that's all been like a really kind of cool experience and quite, I guess, humbling in a way. But I, I had this conversation with my wife yesterday where I was like, do you know what? No, it was this morning. I was like, do you know what? This is pretty cool. I've been inundated with people asking me about jujitsu. I've got a full day of clients and I have had them for the last month. And everything is just growing really nicely. And like, 
I'm just waiting for this to fucking fall down. You're like, you know, that that's how it feels, really. Like I'm just yeah. waiting for this to go. Do you know what? This is is this supposed to happen? Is this what kind of like I don't know. I'm only a year out and I'm kind of like, this this feels like it's a success story, but I don't want to jinx it. You know what I mean? Yes, but wherever there's a peak, there'll always be a trough. So you have to have countermeasures in to prepare yourself for things like that. So you can buffer for things like COVID. <laughs> lockdowns you know where you can't earn as well as or in that particular sector or people just essentially moving on i find that is kind of applicable i've done it I, i'm not the club i'm at now is not the club where i started people change on their journey people join clubs realize when they get to a certain level well, it's probably not the club for me it's not what i'm looking for i'm after something different and they will move around it's one of those things um you can't always provide the best atmosphere uh for everyone um, but yeah, it's, I suppose that's where you look at the business end of things, right? What do I do? How do I maintain stability? Right. Everyone has to pay a monthly fee, whether or not you're training, you pay your subs and that's your, your monthly membership. Okay. And then you've got to sign up for six months, maybe minimum of six months to a year. That's my contract. That's what, that's what I require from you. If you're coming to my. So, yeah, so you have to have those kind of like contingency measures in place that make sure that, well, I can sustain this. It's quite interesting, actually, a jiu-jitsu club. We just moved into uh, a new location and um, we're going through the uh, UK BJJ Association, you know, accreditation. Uh, and, and I think that is kind of like the way forward for clubs, you know, to get get accredited, especially with the news yesterday. I don't know whether you saw it, but you can do BJJ in school as part of your GCSE, which is fantastic. Um, you know, God, I mean, you know, we we were at the we're at a good part with jits in our lives. But imagine coming into it now at that age. It's just, it's all laid out for you, ready to go. So it's going to be fantastic. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going for that accreditation. And, and I think that's good. That kind of sets you up and that makes you look at the business. Okay, who's at the top? Who's the head instructor? You've got to provide your proof, your lineage, who gave you your belts, who did they? So they can trace it all back. They like that. Then you've got to have all your instructors. Okay, so we've got a female instructor for female class. We've got uh, a, an instructor for the youth class. We've got an instructor maybe for an older age group or, uh, you know, or the more advanced class or the fundamentals class. They've all done first aid training. They've all done their, uh, what's the word? Um, what is it called now? Um, it's DBS or CRV or whatever it's called. Yeah, your... Oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind, but I only did it the other day for my son's football. Um, so yeah, you 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 you're basically your your CRB or your DBS checks. Yeah, and um, I forgot what the word is. First aid, oh, all all of that type of those box ticked. You know, those those boxes are ticked, so they can somebody looks at the club and they say, yes, I, I feel confident. You know, sending my child there, or I know if I've got a son or a daughter uh, with a special need or a, a, a disability, I know that there's going to be a class that caters for them. And and that is that's all the work that you have to do in the background. That's all the work that your end goal is when you're teaching that you get paid for. And then when you finish that, it's the mop down and the clean up and the tidy up of the club. Then it's all the administration of the business. <laughs> So for the for that end one or two hours or however however many classes you're delivering on a daily basis, which might be two or three three two or three hours paid on a day, there might be four hours admin that goes into that just to be able to deliver that that you don't get paid for, but you still have to counter it into your business, and then add in all the other things like your clinics. You go from working, let's be honest, in the military, you'd be lucky if you worked apart from when you're on operational tours. Don't get me wrong, or exercises, etc. But outside of that downtime, you probably worked about twenty hours a week, if that. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Wednesdays was sports day, so you finished early for that. Friday was always a half day, you know. So you got off on you, you got on the road to get home early, and then you go into work, and it's like, okay, well, your contact that was a thirty, so you contracted for thirty-seven, and then you have to do everything else behind it. And I think that's one of the areas where people leave in the military really struggle. Like I, I, I did what you said earlier, you know, with the resettlement training, I did construction um, and uh, I used to drive cranes. I used to drive tower cranes. And because I was just like, look, I need to get myself to uni. I need to sustain myself for university. 
what can I do that pays really, really good money? And they said, well, there's some really good money in construction. I said, right, what's the best money in construction? And they were like, right, these are kind of like the top earners, tower crane, tower crane operators. And I was just like, well, up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I did, I did tower cranes to build up, get some money behind me. So when I got to university, I wasn't on my ass and I wasn't, you know, I mean, that came later <laughs> where, you know, you, you're flipping, looking at the back of the fridge for food. Um, that did definitely come later on, but at least I'd got a bit of money behind me to kind of start that journey. But it was, it was mind numbingly boring. It was horrendous. And you go from, you know, if you're in an infantry unit, Marine unit, any active unit where you're doing physical exercise every day, you know, you're doing something, then you've got your additional sport. So if you did martial arts, you box for the regiment, you played football or rugby for the, your regiment or your unit or your corps, you were always off doing something. You had something to do. And then unless you, you make those ties outside, you lose all of that. I think the one thing I always um, struggled with when I left, which found very, yeah, a bit of a struggle to get hold of. There was always somebody around, you know, like a, it might not be your best mucker or whatever, but from a social aspect, you could always pull up, have a little spin a dip or have a conversation with someone, have a brew. You, do you know what I mean? And then in City Street, you don't, you don't get that. You know, yeah, just... I mean, I'm quite lucky in the way because, like I say, I'm only a mile and a half down the road from from uh, from the commander train set. So I got a lot of friends that that, um, that work there. You know, PT staff, and and where my house is is literally on the edge of the the married quarters. Where my kids go to school is, you know, yeah. I walk out of my house. There's a little field, and then the school's there. Where my jiu-jitsu school is, I walk out of my house, walk down the same path that I go to take my kids to school. Literally, it's like 700 meters away, le less than that. Yeah. Um, it's the youth club next to the preschool that's in that field. So everything that I've got that I'm doing is kind of like in a small little bubble. And, you know, I, I bump into people every, every now and again. But I, I think it sounds really strange because, you know, you and I are in the business where we're in. You know, we we are constantly involved with people all the time. We have to communicate well and all that sort of thing. And I'm quite, um, even though I'm, I do talk a lot. Don't get me wrong, right? I, I think I've realised that over time. I like to talk to people and I like to talk um, about lots of different things. But I also, um, I'm quite a secluded kind of person. So, like when I come home from teaching at my school or. You know, I've got my uh, finished doing my day in in my clinic. I come home and I've got my kids. You know, we do the bits and bobs that they need to do. My wife, she's kind of a similar type of person. She works in their clinical health um, for the NHS. Um, she works she works part time doing that as well. And uh, so we just kind of come back into what I call a little bubble. You know, you put a bubble over where you are and anything outside of that kind of doesn't really matter. And that was one of the things, one of the major things I think that I don't know whether people do, whether it's me, I don't know. What, you know, what, as I left, we sat down and with my gratuity payout and my pension and all that sort of thing. And if people say that money doesn't matter, they're a liar because it is. Because if you don't have a financial income, um, you know, then you're not going to be able to pay your bills, right? You know, that that was that came particularly apparent over COVID. Everyone was kind of comfortable and all of a sudden that was pulled from underneath them and people were like, oh my God, what's going to happen, man? And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of one of them. So we sat down, we did some sums, you know, what's our mortgage, what's our outgoings and what our ingoings and how, if I didn't get a job, or let's say, for instance, the therapy business or the jujitsu stuff didn't work out, like how long can I sustain myself on the money that I've got paid out from, um, from, from therapy? Um, and you, you'll laugh at this, right? Cause you just talked about, you know, having backups and stuff like that. So when I went to the career transition workshop um, that, you know, it's a, it's three or four days long and they go along and they talk about CV writing, uh, you know, um, getting a job, the different courses you can do when you, when you, when you transition out. And I was a little bit late cause it was just after COVID and you had to sit down and watch all these really shite lectures about, you know, social distancing and all this rubbish. 
and I rocked up and there was a classroom full of people and I turned up and then, and uh, I can't remember the lady's name. And she said, all oh, right. Um, so, uh, you know, have you got a plan when you left? And I just stood up and I just spilled off all this stuff that I was going to do. And then she's like, all oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and I went and sat in the back, at the back of the classroom and, um, she started talking about like LinkedIn. I've been using LinkedIn for ages. I'd already started engaging in all that sort of thing. And it was all kind of like, um, this is, doesn't mean this isn't meant to sound big headed, but I'd already kind of uh, been doing that myself. Yeah. Prepared. Um, prepared. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't, it wasn't like, um, I hadn't planned to do it. I'd already kind of like every single job I changed, I just put a description into LinkedIn and, you know, did a few little qualification things that I, that I'd done. I'd set up all my profiles and because I'd been doing podcasting as well, um, you know, I, I was quite good at making logos and, and um, you know, the, the little Chad uh, background things that you put on uh, what they call like profile backgrounds or something like that and making everything look pleasing to the eye. So when someone clicks on something that you're doing, they go, Oh yeah, this guy's, this guy looks like he knows what he's doing, not like someone that's just got their head and banged it on their keyboard to get some, get some content out there. Like, do you know what I mean? And um, yeah, I was kind of sat there and I almost felt like it didn't really uh, appeal to me. And then she said to me, um, so um, what you're doing, what happens if you, if it fails? And I went, I looked at her like that. You'll laugh at this. I looked at her and I went, it ain't going to fail. And she said, what do you mean? I said, everything i've done in my career i've made work i've made work whether it's organizing a mass so being a pti um you know you organize big events from you know 10 to 15 people to sport events in a sport hall whether it's you know uh, functional fitness or um cr like a like a crossfit games or something or a triathlon to like a major like i've organized events for like two three thousand people kind of semi on my own you know, so every time I've ever done think I've uh, done something, I've always kind of had this like in the back of my head, like tinkering, like, how do I do this? How do I do that? So when I've come to starting a jujitsu school, doing starting a, 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 a complementary therapy practice and she turns around to me and goes, well, what happens if it fails? I'm like, well, it ain't going to fail because I'm not going to let it. I'm I'm going to make sure so you talking about there about you know the uk bjj association that was one of the first things i did i was like i am not going to set up this bucksy muck dojo bullshit where i just start teaching no qualification no insurances none of this i'm going to make sure all of that's in place i'm going to make sure my policies in bear in mind you know the background i've just talked about for the last sort of like 40 minutes about you know you you, you it would run in the gym you have to have your risk assessment you have to have your health and safety and, and, and all this sort of stuff in, in place right i was like right i'm going to get all of this solidified and in place before i even do anything then because if something does happen then you know I, i've i've got a good solid foundation to fall back on then all that ha has to happen once you've done all of that graft and that groundwork is that you should definitely enjoy what you're doing just go and teach go and train go and go and roll with the people that you're teaching um, you know your therapy practice you know advertise and get clients in you know all, all that sort of stuff and it all just comes become almost comes uh autonomous for me and like I say, like I just said about, you know, 20 minutes ago, it almost feels like it's, I don't know, there's there's like a little hidden anxiety just inside me at the moment that's going like, it's going really well at the moment, but something's going to fucking happen. Like, it, it, but, uh, but I think that's just kind of that imposter syndrome that you get, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that sounds natural. Uh, anyway, regardless, safeguarding, it's safeguarding. That's the that's the course I was trying to think of. I was like, what is that course? Yeah, safeguarding. Yeah. 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 yeah well, um, no, it's, well, it's, good. it's good. And it's good to be like that. You know, it's good to be positive and think, no, no, this will work. Um, in regards to the kind of the club, we could, we could talk about the Marines for absolutely ages. How did you, did you get into JITS through the Marines? And do you kind of, do you liaise with Reorg, Sam Sheriff, and Mark Ormrod or anything like that? Or no, no. So I, I um, 
going back to your first question so yeah. I, I got into um i got into into jiu-jitsu because um i was the unit pti up at the uh Rome Rune's base up in chivness up in north devon so i've been an avid surfer since i was 40 you know i i love surfing it's one of my it's one of my two passions three passions you could say surfing jiu-jitsu and, and my family so i i was kind of got bored with the same sort of training programs in the gym you know i was doing german volume training i was doing just some functional training i was doing like you know i was always i was being like kind of super chad like when the hercules film out film came out with uh dwayne johnson and he was pumping out like this is this is the workout i'm doing so i was like yeah i'll do it i got a bit jacked and stuff like that it's pretty cool but i wasn't really training for anything and then um you know a few of my friends so some sheriffs uh, uh a friend of mine uh you know i've known him for a very long time and uh and martin stapleton as well who's um head coach at uh, sbg rochdale and uh, I, you know, I sent him a couple of text messages and say, you know, you know, what do you think of this? And uh, you know, about training because uh, I went a few Krav Maga uh, lessons and that it was it was rubbish, man. It was like, yeah, don't get me wrong, like uh, I'm I'm not <laughs> I'm not dissing the Krav Maga kind of thing, you know. I think a certain personality and and people would do, but coming from the background I did. You know, in in the Royal Marines, we've had a we've had a um, an unarmed combat syllabus. You know, since two thousand and ten, um, that's been that's been in place, and we used to do things like you know milling and um, and a bit of unarmed combat as well. Um, you know, Fairburn and Sark came from the Commando Dagger and all that sort of stuff. Um, it it was kind of not what I was looking for. Um, you know, it might be what some people are looking for. You know, it's really kind of popular, I guess. Um, but yeah, and it just so happened that everything has a coincidental thing behind it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a, it's going to be a bit deep now. I'm kind of a big believer in fate and, you know, things happen for a reason and all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, I was just milling around the office one day and this this guy came in, uh, just joined the unit and he was a purple belt in jiu-jitsu and a black belt in, um, in judo. And they said, you know, I'm looking to start doing some jujitsu classes, you know, um, can you get some mats? And I was like, ah, do you know what, I will. You know, so I went and found some funding, uh, decked out, matted out a uh, squash court and uh, started training then. And, and um, yeah, started not doing... The, well, it's not the big lad, the heavyweight, the one that... Sherrington. Yeah, he represented no. uh, GB in the Commonwealth Games. No, but I have trained with, with Chris and, uh, yeah. you know, he's, yeah. he's, uh, I, I would say I'm I'm friends with him as well. Um, yeah. You know, he's, we're, we're always really friendly with each other. But um, yeah, well, funny thing, that same year he turned up and after doing his, um, after doing his like 10 year sort of like sabbatical competing for, for England and, uh, and mm -hmm. Great Britain. Um, but yeah, he 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 put some mats down and we started training and yeah, I, I, that was you know nearly well over nine years ago now and um, I, I kind of haven't looked back. I kind of was doing like one class a week and then I kind of getting you know the, the stereotype of getting a little bit addicted to it, two classes a week and you know nine years later I'm I'm kind of teaching it, which is like you know, it's 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 kind of it's kind of like a sweet coolness to it, I guess. Yeah, that's nice. Is it important for you ads to compete? No. No. I've had a and it, you know and, and we talk about coincidences. I have had a, a quite a few conversations about this over the um over the last few months. I did a podcast with uh John Will, one of the uh, one of the original Dirty Dozen, and uh, I asked him the same question as like, you know, does a jiu-jitsu coach or Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach, do they have to be a competitor? And he's like, no, you know, did, uh, lots of coaches all around the world, swimming coaches, for example, do swimming coaches compete at a high level? No, but they're good at coaching. And uh, that's the kind of way I do it, uh, kind of the way I have competed in the past. Um, but I'm very, very self-critical and um, I don't... <laughs> I don't take failure very well, which you could probably get the gist of at the moment, where, where, the way I'm where I'm talking with things, and I and I put a lot of self-induced pressure in, onto myself, um, and uh, but that's not to say I won't won't compete in the future, um, 
but do you know what? I, I enjoy I enjoy coaching. I've got five guys going down to the Devon Open nice. um, Jiu Jitsu Comp in Plymouth uh, uh, in April from from the club, and um, and it's uh, and I just really enjoy watching people transition from not knowing anything to like these guys now are. You know they're nearly on the virgin on blue belt, and and they're it's just it's just such a uh, a fulfilling thing to see to see people progress. Um, so yeah, the answer to your question about uh, competing now, I I I don't see it as um, as something that defines you within jujitsu. I guess that some other some people would have a different opinion to that. You know, it kind of cements your um, your training, uh, but it also depends on what you're what you're doing it for. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the you can make arguments for and against it till the cows come home. To be honest with you, but ultimately it boils down to that individual's personal goal. And like what you said, what are you in? What do you what are you in BJJ for? Do you want to make new friends? Do you want to get in a tribal aspect of martial arts? Do you want to increase your confidence? Do you want to lose weight, etc.? Or do you want to learn a sport and then go into the sport and aspect of things? So, yeah, it, it just depends. I, but I always like to ask Ed, anyone that runs a school, you know, because I like to get their perspective and their uh, opinion. It's interesting you say, John Will, that's actually my coach's lineage coach. And... Um, yeah, he's he's over in the summer, so we're having a seminar which we spoke about, and it'd be good if you could come up, because uh, yeah, fascinating chap. And how was that podcast? I mean, the stuff he's done, just <laughs> phenomenal. I was, I was. There was a couple of people that uh, during the podcast that I've done, and I've only ever been really kind of um, a bit uh, standoffish with, and he was one of them. And there was another guy that I did a podcast with called Pete Maguire. Um, I, uh, I think it was last year before Christmas, maybe. And uh, he he's like an extraordinary guy. Um, he he's like done stuff all over the world. He's written loads of books about you know being in jail in Cambodia, and um, you know he's a black belt in jujitsu as well. You know, got his black belt. You know, sort of like tail end of the nineties. Runs his own runs his own little school and self defense kind of thing, and um he, he's a he's an extraordinary character he writes his own sort of like blogs and things a little bit like john does on um on uh on social media like on facebook and uh yeah. I'm, and speaking to john as well um you know he's uh he's a guy that's come from quite a a a, a depth of of lineage you know almost to the point where the where the graces came over from uh from brazil to america to to teach and he, obviously he's been over there to brazil to to train as well with uh mm. with hegan and um yeah just listen to kind of some of the things that he was saying is um i guess really interesting but it kind of cemented my my idea of the way i think about martial arts and jiu-jitsu uh, as opposed to kind of like this this stereotype that uh, that, that some people have with it like especially in this country um you know whether it's sport whether it's uh self-defense does do they tie together the competition side of things um you know the the cult side of a jiu-jitsu club all those sort of things you know it, it, it's just kind of interesting hearing it from almost like the horse's mouth about the developmental side of things as well. I just thought it was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say when you say horse's mouth, that's pretty much as close to the source as, as you're going to get, isn't it? Unless you get the likes of Hickson on or, you know, Hoyer on or something like that, which is very difficult, but yeah, very interesting, mate. Um, I, I, I am conscious of the time. I, I would like to do a part two. We're, we're kind of only really scratching the surface here, which is, because there's so much to talk about. Um, where is for your for, like for your podcast? Let's let's wrap up on that. Where's that kind of like going? I mean, people always ask me. I've been on a couple of podcasts before, and they say, "But well, what's the goal for the podcast? Where are you going with it?" And I just said, "I don't know. It's just a hobby. <laughs> it's just a hobby. It's just something I really like doing." 
the benefits and the positives of doing a podcast are one because I was super fearful about putting content out there and from jujitsu it's always been a case well get in the eye storm face your fears do it whatever happens happens so I really like that um, and, and the longer I've been doing it the more confident I am at reaching out to strangers because we didn't know each other from you know from, from before but we've interacted on social media and now we've had a good chat and i know if i'm down your neck of the woods you'll be like hey paul pop in have a let's do a session if you're in the midlands for the john will seminar it's like hey adam yeah come it'd be great to see you and then afterwards we can go for a bit of grub but you know like it'll be isn't that the whole point of the you know the good the, the the bigger thing and the podcast has exposed me to much more people, not just jujitsu within the kind of the confines of the West Midlands or, or the UK, all over the place. So that's one, I suppose there's loads of reasons there why I did podcast improve my listening skills, communication skills, um, which I think you never stop improving. Okay. Sometimes and you can go through the motions as a clinician where you say, yeah, oh, tell me about your back pain. And they start chatting and already you're going to oh, just get to a diagnosis instead of genuinely listening to somebody and saying, okay, yeah. And it stops and it forces you to stop and to listen to people. So that's why I like doing it. And it is a hobby and I, it's fun. And, and I like doing the podcast in the same way I like going to jujitsu. Okay. I'm never going to be, Gordon Ryan, you know, that's that ship sailed a long time ago. And and I'm never going to be Joe Rogan, you know, like two of the top people in those areas that we like and we aspire to be and we probably take influence from. Not going to happen. I still put my own stamp and my own fingerprint or thumbprint on one aspect of, of this, what we like doing. So I like it as a hobby, but your own goals. What are your goals for your podcast? I mean, I started a podcast because when I was commuting to and from to and from work, I used to listen to a lot of surfing stuff, and I used to listen to uh, Flow Grappling's uh, Fistful of Collars, and uh, you know, it wasn't necessarily like I was looking to improve my own skills. I always kind of think, well, I could do that, and then one day I just turned around and I went, I just went onto Amazon, and I had a look like. Um, how much some microphones would cost. And I did a little bit of research into kind of like, you know, what editing software I would need as little as expense as possible. So I didn't want to spend a goddamn fortune on buying microphones and stuff, which can cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds. And I was like, you know, so I managed to get a bit of a set, set up for 60 quid. And um and I knew a lot of people that had some pretty cool stories, you know, whether it was military jujitsu or surfing stories, you know, I had enough of a, a, a network to be able to go, do you know what? Um, I, I, I could talk to some of these people because my whole sort of like concept behind it was that these people are never going to write a book. Um, they're, they're never going to do a film about their life. Literally like the the things that they've done, are going to go to the grave with them and no one's ever really going to going to hear about it. So I thought, you know, let's start something. I'll talk to a few people and, and, and kind of see where it goes. And like you say, you're never going to monetize this sort of thing because when I did some research into that, it was like, you know, you need to make, you need to have like 50,000 downloads per episode to even like break, um, break a grand or you know get get a bit of money in the bank to make it worthwhile so like you say yeah. it's never going to be a rogan or anybody like that um but you know the more i did it um i just i just kind of enjoyed i enjoyed talking to people that had kind of similar points of views or even you know having people on that had an opposing point of view that you could kind of have a little bit of a a bit of a challenge challenging banter with that that people would be interested in listening to and it just kind of went from there but like i have to say it's i've kind of tethered off with it a little bit because you know i i was very much focused with it when i was in the military and now the last sort of like yeah i have i have kept up with like doing episodes like trying to do fortnightly episodes but mm. um my my kind of focus has kind of like digressed away from it a little bit um which 
I, I'm, I'm not going to stop doing it. It might just kind of be an intermittent thing that I do. You know, I don't pump out like, you know, one, one a month or something like that. Because when I first started, it was horrendous, man. Like, like I put so much pressure on myself. I was banging one out a week and I was like, oh, you know, I was getting some, I was getting some really cool people on, you know, I had, um, I had some world champion surfers. I had like a few of my mates on as well that were like, you know, doing some pretty horrific harrowing things in Afghan and, yeah, and yeah. then I'd bounce into like jujitsu conversations and stuff. And yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, the answer to your question, what I'm trying to get out of it is, you know, nothing. I'm not trying to get anything out of it. I'm just trying to talk to people and spread their story. And if someone wants to listen to it and enjoys it and gives them a little bit of feedback, and then they can say, you know, in 10 years time when their kids are a bit older or whatever. And you're like, well, you know, if you want to know a little bit more, more about my story, I did this podcast with this guy and it's like in the social ether out there. Go and listen to it. You yeah, know, I like that's that. what, that, what it's there for. Yeah, I like that, mate. That's really good. You're right. There are some people, especially that you probably serve with, uh, who you've come across in your military career that... Um, you just think fascinating individual, amazing story to tell. Let's give them a platform, so to speak. So, yeah, no, I really like that, mate. Okay, buddy. Um, Ads, thanks for your time. We are going to wrap it up today. And, um, yeah, we'll do a part two soon. Uh, we'll let this one build a bit of traction. And, uh, yeah, I'll, you know, we can jump onto the whole surfing aspect of things. That in itself, you know, I mean, to, to talk about, you know, going in full hog to BJJ and surfing. Mate, why don't you just move to Brazil? <laughs> well, I, I could do. My wife doesn't want to leave the UK. You know, we talked about going to Oz and that, but yeah. <laughs> Mate, that'll be good. We'll talk about that next time. We'll have a bit more chat about the Marines as well. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for your time, buddy. Anytime.